Good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Colloquium. Uh, and today we have uh, Dr. James Blair from NIH. Uh, he is the director of the Affective Cognitive Neuroscience Unit there. Uh, and James, <coughs> as you'll notice in a minute, has a charming accent, just like me. <laughs> but it's different. Uh, he grew up in London. Uh, he graduated with honors from his kindergarten, and then <laughs> from there on has had a terrific uh, career that I'm gonna um, spare you the details other than to tell you that, yes, he has published in all those big impact journals. Uh, and what I'll do is I'm gonna tell you, in a nutshell, the reason why we invited Dr. Blair to give a talk here. And I think the reason is that he studied morality <coughs> and the brain. And these are two really big things. And usually when you listen to a talk about morality and the brain, Often, or sometimes, it happens that it's a little bit of a mess because these are really rich concepts. Uh, and I heard uh, James talk at a, a conference in Toronto a few years ago when I was a postdoc. And there, there was a guy who was talking about social behavior and the brain, and it made sense. And so I thought, wow, this, this is really good. And what I'm thinking now is, if he's so good, why I'm still talking? Let the guy talk. So without further ado, <laughs> let me welcome James Blair. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. I hope it's still good after two years. So, uh, so. Um, and it's not gone downhill um, uh, over the last two years, so we'll, we'll see. Um, so what I'm planning to do, I, uh, I'm going to do a lot of, uh, we'll be talking a fair bit about morality. I'm also going to talk about some of the more general clinical issues with respect to the fundamental population I work with, individuals with psychopathy. So you get a bit of a, a broad flavor of a bit of brain stuff, a bit of clinical stuff, and a bit of, um, um, well, actually those are the, the, the two main areas I'll cover. So, just, uh, so it'll be a bit broader than the morality, just to get you some flavor of the clinical populations. And some of these first issues are going to be purely, really clinical um, related issues. The issues about different types of aggression and then different types of conduct disorder. So the clinical side of things. Before we get into really um, the <coughs> roles of these two core brain areas with respect to these types of basic functions and how these types of basic functions mediate some of the really basic parts of moral judgment. I haven't actually got a slide, sometimes when I'm doing this talk, I actually have a slide that specifically depicts where this model, where this model is incomplete, where this model doesn't go on to go into all aspects of moral reasoning. And if I remember uh, at the end, I'll talk briefly about that so you can see where the end points of this model is with respect to an understanding of morality. This is not going to be a full model of all aspects of um, uh, moral reasoning, because moral reasoning gets um, uh, uh, very complicated, particularly in adulthood. But the idea of the model I'm going to be pushing is it tells you about um, why you ever care about um, the uh, distress of other individuals, why you care about care-based moral transgressions. Um, so, First things, really, again, talking about the clinical related issues, this is the population that we primarily work with, individuals with what's called conduct distor disorder. So DSM, um, psychiatric uh, disorder, you've got sort of 17 behaviors, you've got to have done three or more over the last uh, 12 months, and one at least in the last uh, three months, um, in order to be um, um, defined as having conduct disorder. Now, it should be noted there's several worries that immediately you get into with conduct disorder. It's actually extremely common, conduct disorder. So, in some age groups, in some social contexts, 
you can see sort of 16, 17, 18% of individuals will meet criteria for conduct disorder, which immediately becomes worrying because, you know, clearly there shouldn't be that level of a pathology in the population if it's really a genuine, um, genuine pathology. And it becomes particularly worrying when you look at what things individuals with conduct disorder present with, as well as having conduct disorder. So that basically around about 40%, if we had uh, 40 uh, a whole bunch of children with conduct disorder in here right now, about 40% of that population would meet criteria for a mood and anxiety condition. So PTSD, major depression, some other form of mood or anxiety condition. And the reason why that's particularly worrying is that this, uh, there's another population of individuals with conduct disorder, the po population I primarily focus on, and the population that has most relevance with respect to the understanding, the development of morality. So those with individuals with conduct disorder who have psychopathic traits, that population is protected from the development of mood and anxiety conditions. So within the same group of people, or apparently the same group of people, all of which are receiving this classification of conduct disorder, will have one child whose pathophysiology puts them at risk for having a, the development of a mood and anxiety condition, and another child whose pathophysiology protects them from the development of a mood and anxiety condition. And so that immediately should get extremely worried about the, uh, you know, using one label, conduct disorder, when we've clearly got at least two different types of pathophysiology that we're picking up here. And again, if the idea is that in one group, we want to actually reduce the mood and anxiety condition to reduce the antisocial behavior, and another group effectively to increase their emotional responsiveness to reduce the antisocial behavior. It becomes, again, particularly worrying because we have two massively different, in fact, opposite treatment um, uh, targets, but we're classifying the people with exactly this, in exactly the same way. So, um, so that's some of the concerns clinically. The other thing that we uh, that's uh, worth pointing out, again, keeping with the clinical theme for this very early part, is um, this issue between reactive and instrumental aggression. So reactive aggression is having a temper tantrum, a rage response. When I was doing my uh, uh, PhD, I shared an office with a guy who played a lot of uh, video game golf. And that was obviously bad because he should have been doing his PhD, but it was particularly bad because he was useless at video game golf. And every once in a while, he would um, uh, miss a particularly easy putt pick up his keyboard, smash it on the desk, and storm out of the room. And obviously this was really bad because he had to go and explain to his PhD supervisor that he'd smashed yet another keyboard, and could he have another one, please? Uh, and it clearly wasn't because he was trying to teach the keyboard a lesson. He wasn't trying to punish the keyboard. He was just having a rage response and, and expressing it in this, in this way. And that really is this, this you know, you can have threat-induced and frustration-induced Reactive aggression, there's no goal, it's just an explosion to a particularly triggering um, stimuli. Many mood and anxiety conditions, in fact, one that's actually lost off the list, but really ought to be on this, I mean, normally on other slides, actually very prevalent on this list, is post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, it's something that's highly salient at the moment, what with the wars going on with individuals with um, uh, coming back from those wars with post-traumatic stress disorder and showing a significantly increased risk for this sort of frustration and threat-based reactive aggression. But then you've got this other side of things, which is instrumental antisocial behavior. So the person that points a gun in your face and says, I want your wallet, is engaging in instrumental goal-directed behavior. I mean, they had a goal, they wanted to get money, and they just used antisocial behavior to achieve that goal. They could have gone to an ATM, they could have got a job, they could have done other types of ways of achieving the goal, but they decided <coughs> on that particular action. They decided on that type of decision to achieve their goals. And that's going to get us onto the really basics of what we're talking about with respect to moral and amoral reasoning or moral and amoral judgments. The capacity to make a judgment, to engage in an action that harms other individuals. This type of stuff really doesn't have much to do with moral judgment in our sort of classic way. I mean, it has there's lots of legal implications of this division. But the actual reasoning process doesn't have much interaction with um, how we talk about moral judgment. But whether we decide to um, uh, actually be able to harm another individual to engage in uh, to achieving our goals, that's where it becomes um, uh, particularly, um, the, the, the circuitry becomes relevant. Now one thing to notice about instrumental behaviors 
is that all of us are quite capable of doing instrumental antisocial behaviors. If I told you that this uh, laser pointer was worth $100 million, all of you should want to steal the laser pointer. I mean, it's $100 million. You can buy another laser pointer for the university afterwards if you feel that bad about it afterwards. But you may not even feel that bad because it's $100 million. You can spend the rest of your life on an island enjoying yourself. I mean, it's just, you know, from a reasoning point of view, if you don't want to steal this laser pointer in this place now, something's wrong with you. You should be wanting to steal this laser pointer. On the other hand, if to engage, get that $100 million, you have to scoop my eye out with a plastic fork. With any luck, none of you want to do that because it's really quite nasty. And, um, you know, I'm going to scream and you're going to have to worry about my wife being all upset and maybe people will watch you and look really horrified and sad about it as well. I mean, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, distressing things to think about that should guide you away. From that. And I should be very clear, you won't get 100 million for stealing that, and you really won't get 100 million for scooping my eye out. So don't think about either of those options. But, um, but just to, uh, um, you know, this is just another form. All of these things are just decision making. We decide whether we're going to do this action on the assumption of whether we're going to get a particular award or not, and we will be guided away from it if that action is also associated with um, particularly negative consequences as well. And really, when you're getting on to the fundamental problem that we see in this population with psychopathic tendencies, the idea is, is that what we're actually looking at is when you were thinking about the stealing of the laser points example, where there's really no negative consequences and it's just massive gain to you. I mean, it's, or it's trivial negative consequences relative to the massive um, gain for you. That, the idea is that that's basically like it's what it is for an individual with psychopathy who's thinking about whether he's going to shoot you or, or, or do some much more um, egregious action that's going to cause harm. He has the same reduced negative processing of negative um, um, reactions, and so you're getting this um, uh, problematic um, uh, decision making with respect to um, um, uh, deciding on what actions to take place. So that's going to be fundamentally the, the, the story that we're telling as regards to this problem. Just again, just to go back to that reactive aggression, really just because the end, and this will be the, really the end of the sort of clinical side of things, very nicely we can track out the neural systems that are particularly involved in making you have that rage response. There's a neural circuit that goes from the amygdala to the hypothalamus and down into periaqueductal gray that mediates your basic response to threat. And if that circuitry becomes too primed up, or too dysregulated by the systems that regulate it, then you're going to have problems and you're going to be more likely to show reactive aggression. And most of the mood and anxiety conditions either prime up this basic threat circuitry or disrupt some of these processing systems or do both. And that's why the idea is you see this um, increased risk for reactive aggression um, in this one form of conduct disorder. So this sort of negative emotionality, impulsive aggressivity, various terms for it, that's the sort of architecture leading to reactive instrument, a reactive antisocial behavior, but not leading to instrumental. And that really is the only thing I'm going to be saying about that. I just want to make sure from a clinical point of view, you're not thinking in terms of all individuals with cognitive disorder or all types of antisocial behavior, all corresponding to exactly the same things. It most certainly um, doesn't. <coughs> So moving on to CU traits. So this is one way of assessing callous unemotional traits, psychopathic um, tendencies. This is the uh, uh, and hair antisocial process screen device. There's a whole bunch of other ways. But what we're really concentrating here is this stuff on the left-hand side. These, um, and some of these, I should note, are inversely scored. So is not concerned about the feelings of others um, um, is the item you're looking for. So individuals who show psychopathic traits show significantly um, um, higher levels of callous unemotional traits. So they don't <laughs> feel bad or guilty when they've done harm to another individual. They're not concerned about the feelings of others. They um, uh, do act in ways that um, are charming in ways that seem insincere. They don't show um, emotions. So you, there's an array of emotion problems in this population that corresponds to what we call this callous unemotional traits. For the full definition of psychopathic tendencies, we're also seeing various levels of antisocial behaviors as well. But again, those are the things that give rise to your diagnosis of conduct disorder. But these are the things that are unique to this type of conduct disorder. 
This particular type of conduct disorder is the type of conduct disorder associated with reduced guilt and empathy and with reduced um, uh, attachment to significant others. The reason why I'm stressing this, this, is, this is, is because there's a whole bunch, bunch of variables like age, IQ and socioeconomic status, all of which have predictive power for these antisocial behaviours. So basically, the older you are after the age of 20, the less antisocial behavior you show. There's some very interesting things that happen about puberty, but it's very much more simple to just say, after the age of 20, the older you are, the less antisocial behavior you'll show, all other things being equal. The higher your IQ, the higher your socioeconomic status, again, all other things being equal, the less antisocial behavior you'll show. We can predict with these variables levels of antisocial behavior. There's a correlation between these variables and levels of antisocial behavior. But those variables have no predictive power for these emotional problems. We can't say anything about how, emo how much emotional problems the person will have based around age, IQ, or socioeconomic status. And basically, the idea is that what we, again, the fundamental what we're going to be talking about is a condition where there is a biological predisposition that underlies this emotional problem that puts the person at risk for the development of these antisocial behaviors if that person is, is, is in a disadvantaged social um, circumstance. Just to give you some ideas, so this is the, uh, these are the patient population, these are the healthy control. Just to give you some idea of the um, you know, general spread of the kids that we're working with, IQ is just above average. That represents the fact we're using a clinical sample. We, we advertise in the community for patients rather than if we were working in jail. When I was working in jail or special schools back in the UK, the average IQ was in the low or middle 80s. But with this population, we get a nice average IQ. Um, we work with children from the age of 10 to 17 or 10 to 18, depending on the study. But we are concentrated around the, um, um, uh, or slightly, slightly more concentrated around the mean is um, <coughs> about 13, 13 and a half. There's a disproportionate number of uh, males, but in fact we still have at least 30% uh, um, uh, females. So it's not that uh, we try and get a reasonably decent number of females. Uh, and that their SPD was that psychopathy score, obviously massively higher in the patient population. And these are various other ways of indexing psychopathic or callous on emotional traits, obviously again, significantly higher. One, one thing to note is the, um, um, the difference between the callous on emotional trait ratings when the child rates himself <coughs> is very much less than the difference when the parents are rating the children. I mean, the, the, um, the, the people are more likely to tolerate. And again, massive difference on instrumental and on also reactive aggression. Let's just give you an idea of the people we're saying. Again, flavoring on the, the basic stuff before we get on to the, the, the computational processing and the, the moral judgment aspects of things. Um, what are the basic causes of this disorder? Physical sexual abuse, parental neglect, very clear relationship between these variables and levels of antisocial behavior. If you're abused, if you're neglected, you have a significantly increased risk of receiving a diagnosis of conduct disorder. But what's particularly interesting about this, we know roughly what happens to the brain when somebody is neglected or when somebody is abused. It gives rise to a brain where there's increased responsiveness in basic threat circuitry. And we see a comorbid conditions of mood and anxiety conditions. So in other words, this type of routine is directly relevant to that reactively aggressive form of conduct disorder, but doesn't seem to be particularly relevant to this callous on emotional psychopathic trait form of conduct disorder, because the impact of these variables on the brain are the opposite of the actual problems we see in the brain in this patient population. It is, of course, possible that perhaps these social variables coupled with a particular type of genetic history do interact so that, you know, for most individuals, you traumatize somebody, you get an increased amygdala response, you get a more emotionally volatile individual. It is possible that some types of genetic trajectory coupled with the neglect might make you into a reduced, less able to feel guilt individual, but that's not been documented so far. There are a whole bunch of issues, though, uh, both trauma, pregnancy issues, uh, maternal and drug addiction, that likely do impact on the brain systems that we do see relevant to psychopathic traits, make them work less well, and therefore probably do interact in a way with the, with the, with the genetic um, um, issues. Clearly, uh, I mean, I want to be very clear, we're talking about heritability with respect to these emotional problems. We're not talking about heritability of antisocial behavior. One of the oddest experiences in my PhD uh, days 
was somebody actually standing up and presenting data on the heritability of pimping behavior with a sort of implicit idea that your genes were controlling how good a pimp you were, how enthusiastically you engaged in pimping, how often you, you know, all of that sort of thing, which was obviously not a terribly sensible thing to be coming out with. To be fair to the individual, he was a very august member of the field, he did try and backtrack and say that it wasn't probably that that he was measuring, but the fact was he was measuring pimping behavior and looking at the heritage. As far as I was concerned, the damage was done at that point. <laughs> but, so I want to be very clear, I am not talking about genes controlling any sort of antisocial behavior. We're not, I mean, those are, um, what we're talking about though is that the genes are having a significant impact on, this emotional, on these emotional systems and making you either less or more responsive in these basic emotional systems. And again, if you're an individual who, from their genetic history, is a less responsive individual, coupled with an adverse social environment, you're a lot more likely to be on this trajectory of having the full-blown psychopathic traits and becoming a, um, um, uh, very problematic. So now we're going to be moving more into the, um, the neuroscience and exactly the, you know, so we've basically covered uh, why this, you know, that the conduct disorder um, is not a unitary thing, that there are different types of conduct disorder out there. One of these types is this uh, emotional volatile group. One of these types is this callous and emotional group, the psychopathic traits group. We're now, uh, we've shown with the psychopathic traits group, it doesn't seem to be particularly related to neglect and abuse, um, at least as regards the underlying causal um, trajectory. Um, but there is a significant genetic contribution to the underlying pathophysiology. We're now going to go into that underlying pathophysiology. We're concentrating really on two main areas, the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex, or ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the region immediately above the eyes. Now, the amygdala is absolutely critical for stimulus reinforcement learning. There's a massive amount of animal literature showing the importance of the amygdala for stimulus reinforcement learning. And that's basically your ability to learn that there's some things out there that are good and some things out there that are bad. So if every time I showed you this um, laser pointer, you all received $1,000, you'd be thinking that this is the best laser pointer you'd ever seen, and you'd be really vigorously hoping I'd keep on showing it to you so you'd get more money um, for, for seeing it. In contrast, if every time I showed you my watch, you lost $1,000, you'd never want to see this watch ever again. I mean, it's obviously something that's bad, and in fact, if you could destroy it and prevent it from being um, shown to you and losing that $1,000, that's what you'd be doing. The amygdala is critical for that type of stimulus reinforcement learning, learning this is a good thing and my watch is a bad thing. One way of looking at stimulus reinforcement learning is doing aversive conditioning, fear conditioning where basically you have a neutral stimulus, like a, a blue triangle, and it's associated with electric shock. Individuals with psychopathic tendencies have significant impairment in aversive conditioning. They're slower to learn um, that some things are associated with shock or some things are associated with loud noises, and they show reduced activity in the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex during that learning process. They're less able to learn the, bad, uh, the, the badness of things, probably less able to learn the goodness of things as well. And in fact, yes, there is data to suggest they're less able to learn the goodness of things as well. And you see um, uh, reduced activity in these regions, particularly the amygdala, that's so core for learning about the good, uh, uh, goodness of, um, and badness of objects. And in fact, one thing I should also say so what the, and fundamentally what the sort of model is, is the amygdala is absolutely critical for stimulus reinforcement learning, learning the goodness and badness of things. And it talks very strongly with orbital frontal cortex. And orbital frontal cortex is critical for representing that information. So representing to yourself that this object is a good thing, that object is a bad thing, so you can make decisions about it. I mean, this amygdala will allow you to start sweating every single time you see my watch because you might be about to lose that $1,000. But orbital frontal cortex, by representing the badness of this watch, you'll actually be able to start engaging in, you know, I should leave the room if that watch is in the room because I might start losing $1,000. You can start engaging in decision-making processes in an efficient fashion. So the amygdala allows you to learn about the goodness and badness of stuff. OFC represents that information so you can make good decisions about that, that information. One of the ways we learn a lot about goodness and badness is by looking at other people's facial expressions. 
Uh, and I mean, there's basically been two different views, this idea of ambiguity, but also, I mean, we, as I said, the amygdala is absolutely critical for stimulus reinforcement learning. So the idea is the amygdala is absolutely critical for learning about the, um, uh, the um, goodness and badness of things on the basis of other people's expressions. And in the case of, um, uh, that we're really interested here, other people's distress, their fear, their sadness, classic reinforcements, allowing you to learn about the goodness and badness of things. A very nice study that was done by the Berkeley Group allowed a differentiation between the idea of ambiguity relative to the idea of um, basic stimulus reinforcement learning. So they basically matched, they had situations where the person expressed fear of these little objects rather than, um, uh, or happiness of these little objects, rather than fear or happiness at something we can't see. So if ambiguity was the issue, we should see more amygdala activity here because this will be a very, we don't know what on earth she's frightened of or what on earth she's happy about. But if it's stimulus reinforcement learning, we should see more activity here because we know she's frightened about this and she's happy about this. So in other words, we have the reinforcement of her facial expression, the reward value or the punishment value of her facial expression, and we have the stimulus, this funny little object. So we have both of these things present allowing us to basically engage in stimulus reinforcement learning, allow us to learn that this little object is a bad thing and this little object is a good thing. And what you see indeed is very significantly greater activity in the amygdala in conditions where you provide the, the individual with both the face as well as the object. So in other words, what you're doing, if I start showing an expression at something, what you're doing when you're looking at me engaging in that response to that object with that expression is you're learning about the value of that object. And there's a, there's a long developmental literature referring to social referencing, which is the idea of the caregiver being able to communicate very rapidly the value of objects to um, the people they're caring for through the use of expression information. So you, you, know, you show if the child approaches the, uh, 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 the fire, you show the fear reaction, so they'll learn that the fire is a threatening thing to do. I mean, this, the, the use of, social, of expressions and the social reference to provide valence information, cons considerable body of work. And this sort of imaging literature strongly pushes the role for the amygdala playing a major role in this learning process. Now, this population, individuals with psychopathic tendencies, have profound problems in um, um, uh, dealing with the fear and the sad expressions of other individuals. This was an early study looking at sweat responses, skin conductance responses, and you find that psychopathic murderers show significantly reduced skin conductance responses to sad faces relative to um, uh, non-psychopathic murderers. I mean, the, the issue is that um, the selective problems in the ability to generate an emotional response to the sadness of other individuals. It's not an inability to generate responses to all stimuli. Angry faces, pointed guns generate nice skin conductance responses in this population. It's much more related to fear faces, sad faces. They have some profound problems in the recognition of um, fearful faces, which again is one of those things, if you lesion the amygdala in a healthy individual, what you find is that that person shows profound problem in the recognition of fearful expressions. And what you look at when you look at individuals with um, psychopathic tendencies is across studies, this was a meta-analysis of 19 studies, you see very profound impairment in the recognition of fearful expressions. But directly, you can look at it with fMRI, and what you see, uh, this very simple paradigm, just had to say whether the face was male or female. It was a morph paradigm, so you saw one of these faces might be uh, a neutral expression, might be 75% uh, fear, 125% fear, 100% fear, and we also have angry faces as well. And what you see is that healthy in, uh, children show significantly greater responses to fearful faces relative to neutral expressions. Children with ADHD show significantly greater responses to fearful faces relative to neutral expressions. But children with CU traits, children with psychopathic tendencies don't show that response. They show no, there's no significant group differences in the response to neutral expressions, but whereas you, or in these cases, the healthy cases, or the children with ADHD, increase significantly the response in the amygdala to the fearful expressions, this was just not being shown in that population with the CU traits. They weren't showing this increase. And again, just the idea, so basically what we're really talking about, again, just to reiterate this point, what we, the idea is that 
fundamentally what this, pop, what this pop population face is an inability to take advantage of standard socialization techniques. And in fact, if you take nothing else from this talk, but that if you are going to have kiddies, or you look after somebody else's kiddies, or you think you might look after somebody else's kiddies, best way of having a nice guilt-ridden child that you look after is to use things like empathy induction. You basically say, look at the child, you know, if they're an aggressive child, look at look what you've done to Timmy over there, how sad Timmy is, really miserable. Imagine how you'd feel if you were in that situation. You basically can induce, with these empathy induction techniques, a nice guilt-ridden child. There's a considerable um, um, uh, body of research on socialization practices. What's interesting, and there's been several studies now, this type of socialization practices don't work very well with this patient population. So if you have an individual with high levels of CU traits, Standard socialization practices that work so well with a healthy individual just don't have the impact on reducing antisocial behavior in a case in patients with high levels of CU traits. So again, the idea is basically what CU traits are all about is that there's something about this emotional problem that interferes with your ability to be socialized. And on the basis of the data I've shown you just previously, the idea is that what's fundamentally gone wrong is that these individuals can't learn. They can't learn about the goodness and badness of things because of this problem in the amygdala. They're not able, the amygdala is not functioning to show, um, uh, to process the distress of other individuals. And so they're not learning to um, avoid actions that are associated with harm of other individuals. And they're not learning that really other the actions that harm other individuals are bad things to do. So that's the fundamental reason why this type of problem is being observed, or at least that's the theoretical position. This type of problem is being observed because this fundamental problem in the amygdala for responding to the um, uh, fearful faces and learning on the basis of the fearful faces of others. So the second side of this, though, was, you know, I talked about the amygdala, but I also talked about orbital frontal cortex. And this feed forward of information from the amygdala to orbital frontal cortex to allow you to make good decisions. So that the idea is that the amygdala allows you to learn what's good and bad, but it has to send that information up to orbital frontal cortex for you to be able to use it in a decision-making context. If you can't represent that information to systems that make decisions, you can't make good decisions. And what you see if you do functional connectivity analysis is reduced functional connectivity between the amygdala and OFC in the patients with CU traits. They have less of an integrated signal between the amygdala and OFC if you have a youth with CU traits. Less of a, those systems don't interact in the way that they should interact in a healthy individual. And this really um, um, uh, relates directly into um, work, uh, animal work. Um, this, is, uh, this actually is um, uh, work uh, primarily by um, Schoenbaum, and Gower at uh, Hopkins and, and um, Maryland, respectively, who've done considerable body of animal work showing the importance of amygdala and orbital frontal cortex with respect to really basic approach avoidance decision making. So they have a really simple paradigm. The rats are now um, uh, um, uh, an environment. If a good smell is presented to the rat, the rat runs towards the food tray, it will get reward. It will be reinforced for that activity. It will approach and get the reward. If there's a bad smell in the environment and it runs towards the food tray, it will not get reward. It will be held up from getting reward. So basically what the rat has to learn is that there are good smells out there that should make it approach the stimulus tray and get food, and bad smells out there that should make it stay where it is and not go anywhere near the food tray. And what they very nicely show is the... Oh, goodness, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, what they show very clearly is the importance of the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex in that decision-making process. And one thing I just do want to make sure, because you, uh, um, if you read a lot of the clinical neuroscience literature, there's this very strong viewpoint out there that what the amygdala, what orbital frontal cortex does, is it puts the brakes on the amygdala. It's a phrase that you often see in the clinical neuroscience um, uh, field. Orbital frontal cortex is putting the brakes on the amygdala. It's a very um, um, waspish type of view, and I could just about get away with that since I'm at a Catholic university today. And since I'm a wasp, I'm allowed to make rude comments about wasps. So, so, you know, so, you know. But the idea is that as soon as you have an emotional response, orbital frontal cortex comes into gear and shuts it down because orbital front emotional responses are a bad thing. I mean, it, that's the sort of, in its caricatured version of that model, that's what, what, what's going on. 
But I want to be very clear about this. That's not what you see if you lesion orbital frontal cortex. You do not see an amygdala that just flies off the wall and gets terribly emotionally responsive. If I took out your orbital frontal cortex right now, you would show reduced amygdala responses, as you can see in the, in the work with um, uh, rats. Because these two systems are massively interacting. Orbital frontal cortex primes up the amygdala. The amygdala primes up orbital frontal cortex. You take out either one of these two systems, and you muck up the ability of the other one to function. And in fact, actually, it's been very nicely demonstrated that if the, the, some of the um, um, patient populations who have damage to orbital frontal cortex don't develop PTSD. I mean, if it was, uh, if, uh, if uh, some of these emotional uh, conditions were because orbital frontal cortex is not adequately suppressing the amygdala, then the last thing you should see in that patient population is um, um, a reduced rate of PTSD following damage to this region that's supposed to be emotionally regulating. But that's exactly what you do see. If you have damage to orbital frontal cortex, you're protected from the development of, of PTSD. So I just want to um, make sure. The other reason why I quite like uh, putting this in this sort of work is because for those people at least who are interested in animal studies, it allows us the beginnings of thinking in terms of models of the real computational details of what's going on in this clinical population. And because I really think that this way that the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex interact with each other is at the fundamental basis of your, your basic moral judgments, at least your basic care-based moral judgments, it gives us an animal model of some of the really basic processes underlying basic moral judgments. And I'm, I want to be very clear, I'm talking about moral judgments rather than reasoning here, but moral judgments nonetheless. So we can do a very similar paradigm. You know, the, the rat, it was good smells versus bad smells. In the human, we do good numbers or good objects versus bad objects. So if the number 39 is present and you press the button when the number 39 is present, you'll gain a reward. So the number 39 is a good thing. Every time you see the number 39, you should press the button because you'll get a reward. If the number 47, though, is present, every time you see the number, if you press the button when the number 47 is present, you'll get a punishment. So in other words, it's basically like my, my uh, laser pointer watch example. 39 is good, should start responding to 39. 47 is bad, should avoid responses to 40, uh, 47. What you see in individuals with psychopathy have profound problems. Actually, I just ignore the, the, the stuff of flower, but here you have profound problems in this population in learning to avoid the bad stimuli. They're less capable of avoiding that bad stimulus. Uh, I mean, there's been a whole bunch of studies. This was our one in the context of this imaging study, but it's, it's a, an old paradigm demonstrated frequently. <coughs> Now, what's particularly interesting is there's one thing that happens. When you first, if I, you know, if you, um, if something, a novel event happened right now, I suddenly show you a blue triangle, and you all suddenly find $1,000 right in front of you. That is a, you get a massive prediction error. You weren't expecting that blue triangle to give you $1,000. You weren't expecting $1,000 to suddenly appear in your lap. But $1,000 is a massively good emotional thing to happen to you. So you'll get a huge prediction error. I mean, you're, you're not expecting anything. Massive reward came in. You get this massive prediction error very, forcing you very rapidly to learn that blue triangles are good things and you should be really happy when the blue triangle is in the environment. And we can look at that in this particular type of study. So the very first time the individual was responding to a stimulus and getting a reinforcement, what you see the healthy individuals doing is showing this massive um, uh, response in orbital frontal cortex, with the idea that basically what's, that, what it's trying to do, orbital frontal cortex is spotting this prediction error, spotting this really unexpected emotional event, and making you learn really rapidly about it, so that you're basically, you know, it, again, it's this way of orbital frontal cortex now talking back to the amygdala to say, learn, this thing is a good thing, or this thing is a bad thing, you really want to know the next time you see this good thing, or the next time you see this bad thing, how you should appropriately respond to this object. But this is just not happening this, in this population. The individual, the youth with psychopathic traits, are just not picking up on this information at all. And the idea is that's why they're learning about the goodness and badness is so profoundly disrupted. Similarly, what they see is, um, what you see is profound problems in the representation of reinforcement information in this population with an OFC. We were expecting to see um, uh, problems in some of these parameters with respect to amygdala functioning. We see a general suppression of amygdala functioning in this particular task, um, um, rather than interacting with any of the parameters, which was a bit frustrating. 
So the idea is that what we're really talking about with respect, I mean, that was basic judgments of whether we should approach uh, an object or uh, avoid an object. And the idea is that what care-based moral judgments is all about whether we should approach or do this action versus whether we should avoid or um, um, not do this action. And so the idea is that when you're, you, know, you think about doing a particularly antisocial behavior, if you do, were thinking about an antisocial behavior, like my example of the laser pointer stealing, you're basically computing um, uh, the reward value, the 100,000 um, or 100, uh, 100 million dollars, and the punishment value of the, um, the uh, you know, potential um, embarrassment of getting caught or um, you know, um, somebody throwing me out of the university or something along those lines for throwing the, for, for, for the action. So the idea is that what moral judgment, the basics of moral judgments, learning that thinking that this thing is a good thing to do and I should do it, or thinking that this thing is a bad thing to do and I really should not do it, is latching straight on to this basic type of architecture about that allows you to learn that some things are good and some things are bad, representing that information in the frontal cortex, allowing you to make a decision about whether you should do this particular action or you shouldn't do that particular action. And you actually see the same type of architecture coming on in very simple moral judgment um, paradigms. And in fact, actually relatively complicated moral judgment paradigms as well. But this was a, a very simple morality judgment paradigm. And what you see is um, the role of both the amygdala, which is healthy adults here, both the amygdala and all the frontal cortex coming on to more extreme moral judgments. To the, you know, to, to, the stronger the moral item is, the more activity we see in these regions. In youth with CD plus CU, we see reduced responses, particularly to the good items. We actually expected it to the bad items as well. And some other groups, uh, Adrian Rain's group um, has shown um, reduced emotional responses to bad items as well in the amygdala. Um, uh, you see reduced responses in these regions to um, these moral items. And in this particular study, we see reduced, again, functional connectivity between the amygdala and orbit frontal cortex in the youth with CD plus CU. So the idea again is what's happening in a healthy individual when you're representing a moral trans a care-based moral transgression is that you're seeing the amygdala coming on board. It's telling you to, um, um, uh, if you've learned already about this particular action, it's um, the, the old previous stimulus reinforcement association being activated. It's sending a message up to all the front cortex saying this action associated with this level of punishment or this level of reward if it happens to be a good thing to do, you should avoid that particular action or you should approach in a healthy individual. In this patient population, you have a double whammy problem. The first problem is that they don't learn about the goodness and the badness of the action as effectively. The second problem is that they don't get the information sent up to orbital frontal cortex and don't represent that information as successfully as a healthy individual does. And so they can't make as good moral judgments as a healthy individual does. And in fact, you see in problems, and we, we showed it way back when in very simple moral judgments, and just recently it's being um, documented as well in uh, much more complicated types of uh, moral paradigms as well. So that is really why, in my view, we see this fundamental problems in moral judgment as well as moral behavior. And again, it's judgment. It's knowing whether the thing is a good or a bad thing to do. It's not some of the, I mean, moral reasoning in the adult context is much more complicated. When we're often, in adulthood, we often avoid much of the, the damage information and we use intention information as our primary determining factor of whether the action is immoral or not. So in other words, the, the person that intentionally harms the other individual is regarded as immoral. Um, the person that unintentionally regard, uh, harms the other individual is not regarded as immoral. It's not based around the outcome as much, it's based around the intention. So moral reasoning in the, in the adult is, becomes much more theory of mind driven, much more intention driven. Um, but in the basic underlying, um, uh, basic underlying architecture, for why you care about harming other individuals in the first place. And if you don't have any intention information, how badly you'll judge the action will be determined, or the idea is determined by this basic system here, the way the amygdala talks to orbit frontal cortex. And the system that determines whether you do the action or not, whether you approach this behavior, you do the action, or you decide not to, is again, the amygdala orbit frontal cortex. And that's why we see these basic moral judgments 
disrupted in this patient population, as well as these basic decisions to behave in these particular ways disrupted in this population. And I'm just going to end up, I won't, uh, one of the things that you can actually, well, I won't describe this task because it's quite complicated, and I'll just go on to this task. So one of the things that I, and this will be where we're really ending up with, with again, to these sort of more um, subtle issues of moral um, uh, judgment or moral decision making. So in this paradigm, what we're interested in really looking at is the extent to which we can examine what neural systems are engaged according to how bad the action is versus what systems are engaged according to how difficult the decision is to make, um, uh, you know, to make a decision about it. Basically because on previous work we showed that in decision making about the value of objects, the value of objects is very importantly represented by the frontal cortex, but it's not interested in how difficult the decision is. But dorsal anterior cingulate becomes very interested in how difficult the decision is. So if the objects are similar in value, that's a difficult decision to make, and you see activation in, uh, in dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, but you don't see activation of, according to that variable, the normal front cortex. But the more the good stimulus, or the more the bad stimulus, well, the more the good stimulus is good, the more activation you see there. So we did a comparable study in a moral decision-making paradigm. And what we basically had was um, <coughs> items that were um, uh, low in levels of immorality, or morality, but these are um, uh, immorality, as well as high. And we manipulated distance. So uh, we basically, we scored a whole bunch of behaviours. Uh, people gave ratings as to how bad they thought the action was to do. So in fact, and this is an American group, I, you know, I, I do, I found this very disturbing, but in fact, telling your waitress that she's stupid is, much, uh, is a significantly less bad thing to do than telling her that she's fat. So uh, you know, if you want to insult your waitress next time that you're uh, going out to dinner, tell her she's fat, don't tell her she's stupid, because it, it will just not have such a big enough impact. But as you can see, these are, very two, these are two very close items. The scores are actually very close to each other. In, 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 in difference, though, if we're uh, telling the waitress she's stupid versus kick the man's head in, that should be a pretty... If I ask you which one of those two behaviours you're going to do, I like to say that, you know, everybody in this room is going to say, well, we'll tell this waitress that she's stupid. We're not going to kick the man's head. Uh, if you don't pass that, if you think that the best thing to do in this case is to kick the man's head, we still do have some interest in adult work, so I mean, I'm more than happy to talk to you uh, afterwards, although maybe on the phone first. But, um, um, but, um, but we also had high um, close as well, so cheat on your partner versus torturing the dog. So basically, again, here, uh, at least in this sample, and I, you know, like I have the accent, so I can say this is not, I don't have any responsibility for these data, so at least in our sample, cheating in your partner was definitely regarded as a more okay thing to do than torturing the dog. So if you have a dog and you have a partner, worry more about yourself than you do need to worry about the dog, is all I can say. So, uh, so it's something to, uh, to bear in mind. Uh, uh, but um, but um, fortunately, again, here we have a very easy decision. Cheat on your partner versus to cut off the man's head. You know, even for those of you in, in you know, satisfying relationships, you'll probably forgive your partner if they cheat on you, yeah, certainly relative to them cutting off a man's head. So, uh, so um, um, you probably won't forgive either of those items, but you know, this one's obviously worse. And what you see in people's decision making, you're obviously massively faster to make this decision between these two or between these two than between these two and between these two, whereas obviously these are both much more nasty items to deal with than um, um, these two are nasty items to deal with. And what you see very nicely is the level of badness of the action um, is significantly, or goodness of the action is significantly related to activity in the cortex, and in fact also to posterior singular activity. And I don't actually have the slide, but the level of difficulty relates to activity in dorsal anterior singular rather than the front of cortex activity. So again, you see the recruitment of these, these regions are all involved in what we term more complicated. I mean, right up till this point, I've been talking about moral judgment as just whether we should or should not engage in the action. I the amygdala up to all the frontal cortex determining how we represent the goodness or badness of the action. But when we're engaging in many different types of moral judgment situation, we can start recruiting up other systems that have specific functional roles. And here we have, you know, in the case of here, the more difficult the decision, the closer the value between the items that we have to choose between, the more activation we're seeing other regions independent of these systems that actually um, uh, represent the value information. 
Not, oops, not that they don't actually, I mean, the, the clear idea is the uh, dorsal anterior cingulate is operating on this information um, and using this information to make a decision, but it is actually what's determining between the, 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 the items and dealing with the closeness issue more than all the frontal cortex. So finally, just to summarize all of what I've been talking, the idea is that there's a strong genetic basis to the emotional problems of psychopathy. The idea is that what this fundamentally does is it disrupts the integrated functioning of the amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This basically disrupts the individual's ability to be socialized, to learn the badness of moral uh, of transgressions, or care-based moral transgressions. I should again, there are different types of transgressions out there. Not all of them are impaired in this population because there are different types of emotional learning system. But I really don't have time to talk about that, so I'm, I'm just going to say care-based transgressions. The individual cannot associate the conditioned stimulus of the moral transgression with the punishment of the victim's distress. They can't learn the badness of actions that harm it and other individuals. And so consequently, the approach avoidance decision-making is disrupted. The individual doesn't know, is less able to say, I should not do this action. Less able to avoid actions that harm other individuals because they have this fundamental problem in learning about the badness, learning about the goodness of actions um, um, and objects, and also representing that information to allow good decision making to occur. Uh, they also have problems in, um, in uh, frustration, but I didn't talk about that, so I'll just whiz, uh, skip that one. And finally, with respect to some of the um, clinical conditions, one of them again, reactive aggression, fundamentally distinction from um, instrumental aggression, associated with different types of pathology, it's associated with different neural systems. Again, combat disorder is not just a unitary thing. There are different subtypes with very different pathophysiologies out there of individuals with combat disorder. With respect to the combat disorder and psychopathic traits, we're seeing these two core areas. There's other areas involved as well, likely, but these are particularly important, the amygdala and ultrafront cortex. The amygdala with respect to stimulus reinforcement learning, learning the goodness and badness of stuff. Um, and particularly with respect to specific expressions that allow us to learn about the goodness and badness of stuff, so the fear and the sadness of other individuals. And then we'll all find a cortex with respect to representing reinforcement information, allowing us to make good decisions. And then there's a whole bunch of people I have to say thank you to, and that's the end of the talk. Thanks very much. That was you, yes, uh, The obvious question for me is, so can you actually treat people that have the, the C traits um, as far as counseling them or other certain techniques they found? So right now, it's regarded as, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, up till relatively recently, if, if you'd asked me this question about 12 months ago, I'd have probably said it's currently untreatable based on quite a bunch of studies. Having said that, there have been a few studies recently that have suggested that psychotherapeutic techniques, although they don't work as well with this population as with individuals with comic disorder who don't have CU traits, they do have a significant impact on reducing symptom levels. So I don't think that that's because, I think it's, it's possible that it's impacting on the pathophysiology, but it may be really bypassing the pathophysiology and just teaching them a whole bunch of techniques <coughs> that mean that they're less likely to escalate a situation into an aggressive episode, or less likely to immediately jump to using antisocial behavior to achieve their goals rather than some other technique, or just allow them other ways of potentially achieving their goals that don't involve antisocial behavior. Um, so I think that that's probably what happens. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a direct impact on the pathophysiology. I mean, one of the things that we're going after in some enthusiasm now. Now we've identified these brain systems of disruption in this population, we effectively have treatment targets. So we can examine whether specific types of interventions specifically affect how these systems work. And there are things that do specifically affect how these systems work. And therefore, we may be able to bring those back in conjunction with psychotherapy to really help this patient. I mean, even if we could get the emotional systems working with this population, if they don't still have the experience of, you know, to allow them to learn to the badness of how many other individuals, it doesn't really matter whether these systems are working better. They need to learn about the goodness and badness of actions. They need to have the psychotherapeutic environment to actually provide the socialization experiences. But what I think is going to be critical is to have an intervention that will allow the systems to work better, that then psychotherapy can be combined with to help the patients and help the families. So I, I think I followed most of the slide of uh, Jeff Schoenbaum and uh, Miguel Gallagher. But I'm 
wondering whether or not one you're able to associate the here's what I'm thinking. If I can't learn the negative value of something, how can I possibly represent the negative value of something? And so how how do we know whether or not the this, this function results simply from an amygdala damage or from an amygdala coupled with the normal frontal damage? You're completely right. The, um, I didn't have the data, but the one way we can look at this is with the reversal learning paradigms. So reversal learning doesn't seem to require the amygdala to actually, you know, the, the stimulus response learning doesn't seem to require the amygdala. does require all the frontal cortex with respect to learning value, um, um, uh, representing value. And then the learning seems to take place outside for stimulus response-based paradigms outside of the amygdala. And we can show that we see problems in both behavioral data as well as in the amygdala, uh, the orbitofrontal cortex response in this patient population in reversal learning paradigms. Um, um, so they show profound problems in reversal learning and they show profound problems in the recruit or, or in this, these sort of prediction error, negative prediction errors to unexpected punishments in orbitofrontal cortex. But there's nothing in the amygdala in these sorts of tasks, at least from the animal literature, and certainly from our, 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 and our data as well, of indicating pathophysiology. So that's, what, that's the data that, for me, suggests that we can say that it looks like it's a double whammy problem, that there is a problem in orbitofrontal cortex that's independent of the amygdala. Um, there's a problem in amygdala that's independent of the orbitofrontal cortex, partly because the expression problems that we see don't seem to rely on orbitofrontal cortex, but do seem to be critical for the amygdala. And so, so I think that, that, that for me is why, why I say that those two systems seem to be disrupted. Um, but I, you know, on the data I presented, that, that was completely unclear. So, um, so I completely, yeah, I completely agree. Is that one the new, the new, new? Uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, so really Well, I, I mean, in some respects, I mean, the, the, um, so, so we basically go for a massive redundancy approach in the um, um, assessment procedure of callous and emotion, partly because of that sort of worry about whether we're really picking up um, uh, the, uh, the problem. So we go for, they ought to be scoring above 20 on the ASPD, and they ought to score above 20 on the PCRYB. As well, the hair measure, is that that's the the, the hair is the ASPD. Um, the ICU is a frick measure, and the YPI is a poor as a David Cosson Adele Forth um, Bob Hair measure. So um, so we go for a redundancy thing to hopefully get that CU group um, um, because of those sorts of uh, those sorts of concerns. It doesn't seem to be that difficult to pick it up. Um, but, um, but then, of course, we do go to this massive redundancy <laughs> to, be, to be as confident as we can be that we're getting impairment across the three. Actually, we don't tend to use the YPI for that cutoff, but we definitely use the ASPD as a, almost a phone screen cutoff, and then the PCLYV as a um, big evaluation cutoff, and then we look at the ICU just to be on the safe side to make sure the ICU is also picking up the callous and emotional traits as well. The ASPD is a no, the ASPD actually is just a very simple questionnaire. In fact, both of these two, the ICU and the ASPD, are really basic questionnaires, self-report questionnaires from the parent or the, or the child. So the, the child is reporting on their own callus. Well, the ICU child is the child's report. We don't actually tend to use this information because as you can see, the difference between the groups is pretty low when the child is self-reporting. That's the other reason why I don't really like the YPI because that's a child report measure. We don't use that as a cutoff. But the parent ICU, where the parent rate of the child, where we really see a big difference, and the ASPD is parent rated, and the PCLYB is clinician rated. So it's really kind of interesting you talk about neglect and abuse creating the conduct disorder scenario, but not so much with the callous on emotional, which kind of looks like it comes out of nowhere, and the parents can see that in their child. That must be. Well, I mean, to bear, bear in mind that a lot of these kids have been abused. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not, it's, the only reason why we go, I say that it's not is because as we understand the literature on what abuse and neglect does to the brain, it has the opposite impact of what we see in the brain in these individuals. So that's why I assume that it's not causing. But it would definitely not be right to say that these kids, no, these kids have often come from very unfortunate situations. 
Right. Not so much this sample because um, the, for various reasons, not so much this sample. But I remember back in you know jail, in the jail, um, a lot, of, quite a few of these kids are adopted, and some of them have get you know they've it's a complicated family environment, so there may have been a history at one stage, but there's not now because the person's left who did that. Um, but some of them have had some pretty nasty things happening to them at some point. Uh, one of your studies comparing the health controls and psychopathic kids um, showed up for the harm based uh, care uh, showed up right amygdala difference. Is there a lateralization in emotional function with amygdala? I, I assume not. I mean, we sometimes get effects on the right, sometimes get effects on the left. I don't think, I mean, the people have made laterality cases, but I don't think I've really seen any of the laterality cases being terribly robust. I mean, there used to be an idea that I think the left was for conscious types of emotion and the right was for unconscious types of emotion. But, but it's, that's, I mean, D Dolan produced one study, but he's never replicated that effect, and I don't think anybody else has replicated it. We typically see for faces left amygdala, but I've also seen right amygdala. I've also seen bilateral. Is there going to be? Is there a laterality story potentially out there? There probably is. Whether the laterality story is really with respect to things like stimulus reinforcement learning, rather than just the types of you know, if this, if we do on the maybe when we're doing the gender judgment um, in the face processing studies, because we're doing a verbal task. It's priming up left, um, left hemisphere, and therefore we're getting a slightly more augmented response in the left amygdala rather than the right. Maybe in that moral judgment task, I was using pictures, which again, you, know, you sometimes hook into the, some stories about a right hemisphere preferential processing thing. So it could be more to do with what hemisphere is particularly processing the stimulus parameter rather than the amygdala as such. And the amygdala is basically just doing the job in a, in a, non, in a, in a bilateral way. But I can't, yeah, that's the best I can give you as an answer. Could I make a couple of propositions and then ask you to help me by clarifying what I should say. The first one, morality is, is the origins of morality come from our social nature and that the roots of moral action come from our accurate understandings of the emotional responses of others. So, well, I would actually say that both of them come from our understandings of the emotional response. The very basic part, the knowledge that, the feeling that murder is wrong, the feeling that punching somebody else in the face is a wrong thing to do, um, and saying that it's a wrong thing to do. I mean, so not wanting to do it and saying that it's a bad thing to do. The idea here is that the, both of that is reliant on the amygdala learning about the badness of the action and passing that information toward the frontal cortex to make you want to avoid the action. So, um, so that part of mo basic moral judgment with respect to behavior and with respect to verbal behavior it, it, it's thought, well, the idea is that it's, under, it, it's underpinned by the same architecture. Once you get onto the complicated stuff about um, you know, murder in the context of intent versus non-intent, drunken murder versus um, intentional going out and committing homicide, then it, this system begins to become less useful in the judgment process, in the, in the reasoning process, and other things like theory of mind seem to kick into gear. Um, so, um, so, uh, um, but, um, but for that basic stuff, this circuitry is there. And I think the whole reason why we care about it in the first place is because of this basic architecture. Even if, as, as adults, we tend to recruit a whole bunch of other different things for these intent, you know, so much of it is intent based in, in, in adult reasoning. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're done. Thank you so much. Okay,